welcome to lecture number six in our continuing series on physiological psychology. Today we'll be talking about introduction to the cerebral cortex. This will be a fairly short lecture just outlining some of the major structural areas and the organization of the cerebral cortex. We'll start off with a basic introduction of the cerebral cortex. This is the most prominent part of the mammalian brain, certainly the most prominent part of the human brain. It consists of the cellular layers on the outer surface of the cerebral hemispheres are six cellular layers on the surface of the cerebral cortex which are called laminae which we'll talk about into a moment talk about here in a moment the cerebral cortex is divided into two halves or hemispheres which are joined by two bundles of axons called the corpus callosum and the anterior commissure this is how the two halves of the cerebral cortex communicate with one another uh, as we learned in our last lecture uh, all of the information from the uh, right side of the body is communicated to and from uh, the left part of the cerebral cortex and vice versa and then information between those two halves uh, communicate with one another across the corpus callosum. Uh, the cerebral cortex is more highly developed in humans than in any other species. Uh, the only species that comes close to us is dolphins which we'll talk about here in just a moment. So this is really where the bundle of the processing in the brain occurs is in the cerebral cortex. So humans have the largest proportion of brain devoted to cortex. In particular, we have the largest frontal lobes. And the frontal lobes really seem to be an important part of understanding how we are able to do a number of the things we are, plan and coordinate for our future, um, devoted to complex muscular movements. Um, some of our linguistic abilities all have that large, seem to be devoted to that large cerebral cortex. In fact, some people think that our consciousness seems to be located there as well, but there's a lot of controversy about that. Uh, you can see here related species such as the chimpanzee, gorilla, orangutan, gibbon, and macaque monkeys have much, much smaller uh, frontal lobes than humans. Uh, oftentimes the macaque monkey is used uh, in studies of the visual cortex because they have a relatively similar outline uh, to their uh, visual cortex, but in terms of the frontal lobe, uh, humans really are apart uh, from other species. Dolphins are close in terms of their overall size of their brain. In fact, they seem to have pretty close to the amount of uh, processing uh, capacity that we do. Uh, they certainly have uh, complex abilities to use things like echolocation and their auditory systems process a great deal of information. Um, of course we don't know a great deal about how those work, uh, but we do have very large um, cortices compared to other species. And again, the dolphin seems to be uh, the closest. One thing uh, I do want to note, because this has come up actually in recent uh, news articles, there are sex differences in overall brain volume. Uh, this came up uh, in the European Parliament recently and some other discussions about uh, sexism. I want to make something very clear. While that is true, uh, men do have larger volume sizes in brain, uh, when you adjust for body size, there's actually no difference. The only reason men's ha men have men's men have larger uh, brain volumes is because they have larger heads. Uh, women's brains are more densely packed. Uh, in some ways, they may even be more efficient in terms of their overall processing. And so there are no functional differences um, overall uh, that are related to size differences in brain. And in fact, as I said, women's brains are just something more densely packed, uh, don't have as much supporting cerebral spinal fluid, and as a result, are simply smaller because they're compacted into a smaller container and that's really the only reason there's any volumetric difference. <coughs> the way the cerebral cortex is organized is in six layers, um, six primary layers I should say, uh, which have some sort of multi-form layers, uh, the inner pyramidal layer, the inner granular layer, the primal cell layer, the external granular layer, and the molecular level. Uh, in terms of the composition of these laminae, uh, the molecular layer is mostly dendrites and long axons. So this is of course the uh, ingoing and outgoing communication layer of the cerebral cortex. The external granular layer consists of smaller pyramidal cells, while the pyramidal cell layers are sort of more larger sized pyramidal cells. The internal granular layer, small cells, is the main site for incoming sensory information. The inner pyramidal layer is the main so source of motor output, and these are large pyramidal cells. And then finally in the multiform layer there are spindle cells. So these six distinct laminae or layers uh, are parallel to the surface of the cortex. Uh, 
these are also uh, divided into columns that lie perpendicular to the laminae. So you can actually kind of see them in this uh, illustration here where there are uh, clear columns. These columns have functional properties. In particular, we're going to talk about these columns uh, when we start talking about the primary visual cortex. So we have, for example, ocular dominance columns, uh, which go between uh, left and right, uh, your left and right visual fields and your left and right eyes. Uh, this is one of the ways in which our uh, sense of depth perception is developed. We'll also see that these columns are organized in functional ways as well. So we'll see, for example, um, that the type of stimuli they respond to uh, vary systematically from one column to the next. So the uh, columnular and laminate organization becomes of a f functional importance in a number of areas that we'll discuss. In terms of the functional areas of the cerebral cortex, uh, the cerebral cortex is of course divided into uh, four uh, lobes, the frontal lobe, the te uh, temporal lobe, the parietal lobe, and the occipital lobe. You can see here in this left uh, figure, uh, the yellow is the frontal lobe. It's involved in planning of movements, recent memory, some aspects of emotional processing, planning and coordination for future activities, working memory, attention, all of those are primarily uh, the frontal lobe. And you can see at the very end of the frontal lobe is the precentral gyrus, which is located uh, just anterior to the um, central sulcus. This is the primary motor cortex. Um, just posterior to the central sulcus is the postcentral gyrus, which is our primary somatosensory cortex contained in the parietal lobe, which is shown here in green. Uh, the uh, parietal lobe is involved in um, spatial attention. It's also involved uh, in what's called the dorsal stream, uh, which is a part of our wear pathway in the visual system. Uh, the occipital lobe is entirely devoted to visual processing. Um, lots of work being done there in, the, in visual processing. And then the temporal lobe, uh, here located in pink, is um, our primary auditory cortex, some advanced visual processing such as the fusiform face area, uh, and uh, also part of our linguistic abilities. So if you look over here to the right, you can see some of the sensory areas. The olfactory bulb is tucked in, uh, as we've seen in previous lectures, underneath the prefrontal lobe. Our somatostatic senses are located here in the postcentral gyrus, auditory cortex here in what's called the area A1 of the temporal lobe, and the visual cortex is primarily uh, the occipital lobe. So the occipital lobe is located at the posterior end of the cortex. Uh, it's known as the striate cortex and because it appears striped when you uh, look at it in uh, its cellular layers. It's also the primary visual cortex and highly responsible for our visual inputs. Uh, this is the sort of second stop of the visual pathway. It goes from uh, out from the optic nerve to the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus and then on to the primary visual cortex or what we call V1. Uh, damage to this area can result in what's called cortical blindness or blind spots, which are scotomas. So there's a complete loss of visual processing in those functional areas. Uh, the areas are laid out in a um, spatial arrangement um, such that areas associated with our external environment are sort of mapped out under a visual cortex in a systematic way. So uh, this is the occipital lobe and it's entirely devoted to visual processing. The parietal lobe uh, it contains the postcentral gyrus, which is the primary somatosensory cortex, which is located here just past the um, central sulcus. It's our primary target for touch sensations and information from muscle stretch receptors and joint receptors. Also responsible for processing integration, uh, integrating information about eye, head, and body positions and from information sent from muscles and joints. So this is where we get sensory motor integration. Um, where our sense senses are um, directly involved with understanding wh where our body is in 3D space. You can see here the somatosensory cortex. This is laid out in a homunculus or map of the body. Some areas of the body are overrepresented, which results in what's called cortical magnification, an issue which we'll return to when we talk about somatosensation uh, in coming lectures. So if you look at the way these are laid out, the somatosensory cortex and the primary motor cortex are laid out in very similar maps. Uh, you can see here in the center, the somatosensory cortex uh, is laid out in a very similar fashion to the motor cortex, which is located on the far right. 
can also see that some parts of the body are dramatically overrepresented in terms of how much cortex is involved. So if you look uh, here in the center, the lips, face, eyes, nose, uh, our thumbs and fingers are much more represented in the cortex compared to the relative amount of space they take up on our skin. Compare that to our uh, elbows, um, sort of central trunk area, or our core area, and our legs, much less cortex associated with those. These are much less sensitive areas. Our hands, fingers, face, uh, etc., are much, much more sensitive uh, to touch. So the parietal lobe is also essential for spatial information as well as numerical information. So something like using one's fingers to count represents an overlap of spatial and numerical tasks. And we also know that this area is involved in visual spatial attention, something we'll uh, get to at the very end of the semester when we start talking about cortical representations of attention. So for example, you see here the inferior parietal lobule. In patients who suffer from a disorder known as hemispatial neglect, uh, in their right inferior parietal lobule, they've suffered usually some sort of stroke. And as a result, they no longer pay attention to anything on their left side, uh, including the left side of their body and the left side of their visual world. Uh, so the parietal lobe is um, pri directly involved in directing our attention in space. The temporal lobe is located in the lateral portion of each hemisphere near the temples. This is where auditory information uh, goes. This is the primary auditory cortex and is essential for processing spoken language. It's also responsible for complex aspects of vision, including movement and some emotional and motivational behaviors. The frontal lobe contains the prefrontal cortex and the precentral gyrus. The precentral gyrus is also known as the primary motor cortex, which is responsible for the control of fine motor movement, which we've talked about already. Uh, the prefrontal cortex, this is where the integration center for all sensory information and other areas of the cortex, which is the most anterior portion of the frontal lobe. Uh, this is where uh, we sort of the command and control uh, of our um, sensory motor processes as well as things like working memory. So the frontal lobe is particularly important for our sort of everyday functioning uh, and also responsible for um, things like executive functions, working memory, etc. So if you look at the frontal lobe, this is one of the things that separates us from other species. Uh, humans have very large uh, frontal cortex, particularly prefrontal cortex, uh, compared to other species. It's one of the reasons we uh, appear to have uh, greater intellectual abilities, uh, etc., because it's responsible for our, some of our ability to plan and coordinate our future. So this is uh, part of the brain that's responsible for higher functions, such as abstract thinking and planning our ability to remember recent events and information, such as working memory. People with damage to the prefrontal cortex um, exhibit, exhibit delayed responses to a number of different tasks. Um, they respond to something they see or hear after a delay. Um, and so uh, this is a particularly problematic because the prefrontal cortex is susceptible to damage, uh, particularly in um, traumatic brain injury cases. Uh, we'll talk later about how the um, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is involved in working memory and other uh, cognitive tasks and cognitive functions and can be damaged in uh, traumatic brain injury cases. Uh, the most dramatic instances of traumatic brain injury, or brain injury I should say, uh, were actually caused intentionally uh, through a very dubious process called a frontal lobotomy or prefrontal lobotomy. This is where there's a surgical disconnection of the prefrontal cortex from the rest of the brain. Uh, this was invented, uh, for want of a better term, by a man uh, who did the first uh, prefrontal lobotomy uh, with an ice pick from his kitchen. Uh, he would have the patients, he would do them in there, usually in their home with no anesthesia. They would tip their head back, he would insert the uh, ice pick into their nose, tap it through their skull, and then rotate the ice pick around and sever the connections from the frontal lobe. Uh, about 40,000 of these were performed in the 40s and 50s, mostly people with schizophrenia, but later others with less severe mental illnesses. Uh, patients were left with apathy, lack of ability to plan, memory disorders, and lack of emotional expression, um, really kind of almost zombie-like in some of their instances. Really, and there is no reason for these, these procedures. They had no benefit uh, aside from making people slightly catatonic and probably easier to cope with. Um, so you can see here a patient getting ready to undergo this kind of prefrontal lobotomy. Uh, 
Uh, here they're going in to the side of the eye uh, to sever the um, cortex. Well, that's our brief introduction to the cerebral cortex. Uh, next, we'll start talking about some of the methods we use uh, to study uh, physiological psychology.